Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I'm your host, JP John Paz. With me today is a very special guest. He's a former Triple Crown MCW champion, the world champion, the tag champ, the TV champion. He's been an NWA cyberspace tag team champion with CM Punk. He's been an ECW, WCW, WWF, TNA, and everywhere in between. He is Mr. Julio De Niro, a.k.a. Hot Stuff Julio Sanchez. Welcome to the two-man power trip. How are you doing? Wow, what a nice introduction. You know more about me than I do sometimes. That's pretty awesome, dude. Appreciate it very much. <laughs> you look a lot different than uh, the last time we saw you with the long hair and TNA. and Yeah, yeah, the braids maybe. Yeah, and the yes. grays. I think the grays are kind of new. You know, yeah. uh, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe they're not that new, but new to maybe some people. But uh, yeah, I, yeah. So, yeah, so hey. what's been going on in your world? What have you been up to? Uh, I'm a lot like you. I do sales. So um, that's my gig. Um, and we're not that far off. Um, I do construction sales. So I sell equipment and sometimes some tools and I rent them. So people may not want to buy a hundred thousand dollar excavator. So they rent one for a couple thousand dollars a week. And um, I make that happen in Queens, New York. And I live in Long Island with my wife and three kids. And my wife uh, used to be my uh, valet, the astonishing Miss Michelle. And uh, some of these guys who are watching and listening may remember her. So that's nice. the, that's the story. You got a nine, eight, and six year old, two boys and a young daughter. So it's a little crazy in life. Yeah, it's crazy, but it gets done. I know you mentioned the other day to me that in 2019 you had wrestled with Create a Pro. It was you and PJ and Sam and a bunch of the guys had a match. But was that the yeah. last match you've had? Or you it was, and that match? was the first match I'd probably done in a while. And wow. I actually, for some reason, still have this card here, which mm. may tell people the story. So Sandman and Little Guido Loaded. and Just Incredible and myself teamed up with a uh, young up-and-comer from Creative Pro Wrestling to take on five other Creative Pro young up-and-comers who probably by now, two years later, are probably like, you know, champions and running that show or probably working for AEW for all we know. So uh, it, was a, it was a fun experience and I had to get ready to wrestle again. Uh, I hadn't wrestled in, I'd say, easily five years at least. And uh, I took it seriously because I didn't want to be a slug. So I was training two or three days a week at the Creative Pro Wrestling School, which I recommend anybody in the New York vicinity. It's a great school. And uh, I was running a lot of cardio and uh, doing a lot of stuff to not embarrass myself or the uh, industry when I did wrestle again. So it was a nice, fun experience. Very cool. It was just one of those things where it's like, wow, you hadn't wrestled in so long, but then you wrestled then, but then you haven't wrestled since. I wonder how the hell they got you. Uh, he called me for some reason, uh, Brian Myers, and asked if I wanted to do that special one-off for the, uh, they called it Hardcore Halloween. So I, uh, I figured, you know what, why not? And my kids have never really seen me wrestle because they're older now. Uh, when they had been going to my shows, they were probably like two or one and just whatever. So we were just, they were just, you know, whatever. Couldn't understand it. Um, so I wanted to give them uh, an event to check out. And I still might do it another time uh, in the future. We'll, we'll have to see. I mean, it's, you know, it's not going to pay my bills and it is a lot of work to get ready to do a professional wrestling match the way I do my matches. I, I don't have the luxury of being uh, an old time television superstar where I can kind of, you know, quote unquote, call it in. So I got to be in shape for that a lot. So, you know, I take it seriously enough to, you know, I have to put another three months into it probably and really train like a real athlete would do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I feel like the first time I saw you wrestle, I want to guess because I was trying to figure out when it was, but it had to be, I'm guessing, 1997-ish in Hazlitt, New Jersey at Raritan High School. I'm trying to remember if it, it could have been 96, could have been 98. But I'm Tell me just... who promoted the show. I'll New Jack know. City. Wow. Wrestling. I thought you might remember that. Okay. So was I yeah. teaming up with Don Montoya as the Latin Lowriders tag team? And you were in a battle royal where, where Virgil was I believe the end ended up being the winner and he had the NWO shirt on. I remember at the end of the show we asked him for his tape. He gave us all of it the tape. You know, remember he wore the big tape like yeah, almost yeah. all the way down to his form. He gave us all of his tape. Um we asked him for he had the actual cassette tape of the NWO song so that they could play it. He said no, you need to keep that. I just remember that. And I also remember Bam Bam was was booked, supposed to be in the car, but showed up late. So mm. he they, for some reason the promoter wouldn't let him wrestle and bam, I kind of I kind of have a uh, yeah, a very, very vague memory yeah. of that situation. And maybe Bam Bam was there and yeah, they 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 probably spent the money on somebody else for all we yes. know. Or maybe in reality the house maybe wasn't as deep as they thought it might be. I'm like, well, if you're not here, we're just gonna keep that. So so he showed you know. up late, but he was pissed. I remember because me and my brother were standing there and he had his bags. He's like, Are you kidding me? Hey, I'm here. Right, he goes, you right. booked me. Like, he was pissed. I don't blame him. Yeah, well, he made it. So usually you can make accommodations, but I kind of remember that. So did you go to a lot of New Jack City wrestling shows? 
a bunch. Of Did you do any outdoor and, ones? I remember once Raven was there with Lupus, and it was just always chaotic, fun times for that. There for that was organization. one in like Matawan, New Jersey. That I remember that was like literally almost every ECW guy. So I was like, why isn't this like an ECW show? Was it a Sunday yeah. afternoon when they didn't yes. have any shows? Yeah, that was yeah. a good one. Did you ever go? Was it an outdoor stadium or anything like that? I remember doing some outdoor to, shows there. Maybe I, Tom's River. I know that there was like a sports arena located nearby or okay. like a sports complex. Yeah. So probably Tom's River has a, a bunch of those. It could have been Tom's River. And too. that would have been usually run by like Donnie B, which was uh, Nova's brother, right? And uh, yep. I, remember, I remember having a lot of fun there. So those were those were good times. I'm glad you remembered and even brought up New Jack City because that's uh, that's interesting. So, yeah. It's that roster. I love I love going back and looking at the roster because like, oh, who's, who's like you who's, who's Ramirez, you remember that guy at all? Yes, he was nuts. And, and there was another guy from Baltimore that I trained with when I first started wrestling from the Monster Factory of Baltimore. He had long hair and may have teamed up with Twiggy Ramirez, and it sucks that I can't remember his name, but I did buy his boots at one point from him and I wore them for my early days. But the Inferno was... Kid. No, well, that's a different guy, but I do remember okay. I remember Danny the Inferno Kid very well. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I've had a lot of fun with Danny. Danny and I go way back. So uh he's he's an awesome right. There's a guy from Maryland. I can't remember who teamed up with Tweaky Ramirez, but it'll something hall, Adrian Hall. Does that ring a bell at all? Or is am I just going mm. way too deep into the too annals deep, of yeah. indie wrestling? Even though I know all, all these guys, it's definitely yeah. too deep. Adrian Hall. God, I would just figure you'd be like, Yeah, I know him. Do you know Ricky Blues by any chance? Another <laughs> Maryland nope. wrestling guy. All right, I'm just gonna ruin your show, so I'll stop while I'm ahead. All right, cool. So but do you remember a starling? Devin Dude, Storm. not even – don't even remember. I actually still text a Starling. Uh, Mike Quackenbush. Love Mike Quackenbush. I know that he went through some things a while back. But, yeah, I, mean, I wrestled Mike Quackenbush a bunch. Had a fun time. Him and him and Montoya and Reckless Youth had a little group Another called the Black T-Shirt Squad. You remember any of that stuff? Yes. Yeah, yes. So oh let me ask God. you something. I don't want to be annoying, but do you think your audience would want to hear any of this stuff? Or are we just, like, beating this old indie Jersey I, stuff to death. Cause I love I, it, but I, I'm just wondering what your audience I think is they thinking. better love it. Cause if you're, you're, if you're a Jersey guy and you're around like my age, <laughs> that's like awesome. me and my buddy still mention like guys like reckless use. I was like, Oh my I God. Let's reckless talk about reckless dude for 20 yeah. seconds. How good was that dude? He was awesome. Tom the Carter's best, the man. Right? Yep. He was the best indie wrestler that we all we I learned so much from him. It's so crazy. I used to just do my blow through finishes. He's like, dude, how come every time you wrestle, you blow through your opponent? Like you make the comeback when you're the babies and you just win. And I'm like, well, why not? And now I learned it from Hulk Hogan. It's like, dude, what about the old false finish? I'm like, what's that? I listen. And he's like, we're going to do a match sometime. And, and he just taught me little tweaks to the go home. And, and, and I never, not say I can't say I never looked back. I just, just, he just created, he pulled me up a little bit. You know, he just taught yep. me some things I just didn't even pay attention to. Didn't notice, didn't care. Just too young to know. What was going on and uh anyways he was awesome and um and yeah so i'm glad you mentioned him because tom carter is great and he helped me you get know, on to the um what was that heroes of wrestling pay-per-view did you ever see that one the worst pay-per-view of all time you against who was it two gold scorpio yeah yes. i had a good time with that not every match was horrible but yes i could see how you know, some people would say that about that pay-per-view um but there was some but real he, thinkers on there yeah oh i'm sure there was <laughs> I, I didn't get to watch it but um but but I remember he went to WWE and was working down with Steve Regal, probably, and whoever was in Memphis at the time. So he couldn't do that show. And Mike O'Brien, Mike Lombardi goes, hey, do you want to work on that? I said, of course I do. What are you talking about? Yeah, of course. I'll, you know, I'll wrestle any of those guys if you give me a chance to. So, uh, you know, but Reckless Youth kind of gave me that opportunity to even get on a pay-per-view, even one that would be considered infamous. So, uh, yes. yeah, so glad you mentioned him. Yep. I feel like if he came around like 10 years later, he'd be a huge star. You know what I mean? It's one of those things of he came around in the wrong area. He was like he was a little too big, but then he was a little too small for WWF. Like he was in like yeah, a they had place. luchadors back then. He could have they could have given him a shot. Whatever it doesn't. It's you know wrestling's wrestling. It's not a sport. If it was a sport and it was about who can beat who, then a lot of people wouldn't be in it that are in it. And uh, and if it's you know, but he was great. And and if you ever spend time looking up his matches, they are uh, very very classic. And 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 he. He was very modern and he would fit in today too. Like he would be yep. totally be able to go in there and put on a show with whatever he did then would still work today. And uh, and that, that's important. He was just a really good worker. I, liked him I feel like a lot of guys stole stuff from him without realizing they stole stuff from him. Like I'm, he's sure I I'm sure I did. I'm sure I did. Yeah, I'm sure I took because I, you know, we all wrestle each other. I'm trying to think who else was cool. So you mentioned uh, Ace Darling, uh, yes. Chris Ford. You know him? Hell yeah, Devin. Storm. All right, yeah, 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 right. So we all worked each other, like uh, Lance Diamond. So uh, yes, Simon Diamond, yeah, Lance, yeah. So at that point, yep. all us group, we just all worked each other in Jersey and Delaware and Pennsylvania and Maryland and Connecticut. But we all were all 
stealing from each other almost on a nightly basis, you know. So we're just like, you know, learn that and do that tomorrow on this show. Which, and we'd all be moving around. So we've been always, I know Reckless Youth would go on shows with Dom Montoya and D'Lo Brown out in like Michigan. And I was like, mm, I'm not driving to Michigan. That sounds crazy. But they would do those trips and I'd end up in Ohio. So at some point we all did long drives. But I remember thinking Michigan's really far. So, you know, but there's a lot of learning going on in those days. Those uh, mid to late 90s. A lot of good stuff. Definitely enjoy. Yeah, it. what a crew! If you just look back, I mean, what a crew of awesome guys that you know you're yeah. part of and you're in there. How did you kind of break in in Baltimore? I know it's, I guess, Axel uh, Rotten is there, but is that like your basic main trainer back then? No. What's funny is, uh, so I had two schools. I lived in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is right next to Washington D.C. So there was a Baltimore, there was a Monster Factory Baltimore, which was basically an offshoot of the one in Jersey, Dwayne Gill. And a guy named Dave Demiglio, who wrestled as in a tag team called the Goodfellas. I um, can't remember what his wrestling name was. It wasn't Romeo Valentino. That was his tag team partner. But um, G- Dino Casanova. So these guys had a school. And it was like 25 minutes from my house. It was very convenient. And I was uh, still in college. Um, and I had a choice of going there or another school run by Neil Superior, which was the NWO. It's about an hour and 10 minutes away out in Hagerstown. So to make a long story short, I chose the one that was closest. And uh, Axel Rotten would be there occasionally. Never saw Dwayne Gill. Uh, Demiglio was kind of like the head trainer. Dwayne Gill was doing his TV, I think TV tapings and possibly even house shows with Barry Hardy. So like he really wasn't at the school much, but he, he probably put some money into it. Um, and then uh, guys like Hack Myers would be there. Ramblin' Rich Myers, Axel Rotten. I'm trying to think of anybody else. Uh, uh, Romeo Valentino. Um, and uh, God, and then a lot of guys from my era um, that were young like me who were just kind of learning the game. But that's how I got started. It was close enough to go to, and it was a, it was they had their own shows. Not many, but they ran shows, and um, they taught us uh, the ropes. And I met Bob Starr there, who got me my w- WCW TV tapings about less than a year after I'd started wrestling. And um, I probably didn't belong anywhere near those places, but uh, I was allowed to get on TV. So that's kind of crazy, but it is what it is. Bobby Starr was a star of some of those, like, you know, getting a, a great mm-hmm. ass kicking. You were mentioning to me yes. that Kevin Sullivan gave you quite a bit of an ass kicking. Wow. More than, you know what's funny? Today you'd call that a TV feud. If you, you know, in other words, the, the head guy or the, the lead guy would be in a feud for a belt or something on the pay-per-views. But sometimes there'd be like a pesky guy that's dealing with him on. So he's kind of got two issues at the same time, the pesky guy on the left and the big prize on the right. But maybe the big prize is that guy's taken up. So, you know, he's going to get a title shot eventually, but he's still got to deal with somebody else who's like, you know, nipping at his heels. So obviously I'm not going to put myself in that position because I was only one year in the business. But Kevin Sullivan put me on those shows to wrestle him more than once. And all these Dungeon of Doom guys. And, then you know, it almost as if I had a TV feud with them. But I never won. I barely got any offense if I was lucky. And, uh, and and uh, but, you know, I kept getting chosen to wrestle Kevin and wrestle, um, you know, I, God, it's so many guys. Ming. Ming. Or it'd yeah, be, I say. Yeah, oh, my Kamala, the shark, you know, who was Earthquake. And, I mean, uh, the Zodiac, who was Brutus Beefcake. I mean, it just didn't matter. They were like, if I got sent to a TV taping, I pretty much was wrestling usually a uh, Dungeon of Doom, um, you know, I guess whatever you want to call that, uh, a member. So, you know, that was like a my initiation. Let's beat this kid to death. And usually they were really big dudes just kicking me, you know. Men would kick me in the face and that would be a finish. And I was, thank God it was over because, uh, you know, the guy's really talented, but he – you know, hit pretty hard. So uh, I remember him, he gave me a backbreaker once and it looked ridiculous. So it looked, he snapped me in half. So uh, luckily I was pliable. So I could keep coming back for more. But yeah. So how do you like, I guess, get in like to WWE? Is it literally just that Bobby Starr has to pick guys? Yeah. And he just picks the honest like, truth That's is, it? yeah, it's so simple. It's so ridiculous. Cause I didn't belong any, like I said, I admit I didn't, shouldn't have been anywhere near those guys. I had no training. I'd literally been to wrestling school and you know, yeah, I learned how to fall and I kind of, I did a few matches, but I mean, I certainly couldn't work. You know, you, you can't put me in a match with another guy who's been in a year and we're going to tear the house down or even attempt to, we're going to just stink the building out. So I, I don't mind admitting where I was, but Jody Hamilton, which is the assassin, uh, Nick Patrick's dad was booking the enhancement talent. And back then enhancement talent didn't have to be competitive. You just had to get in the ring and let the other dudes pretty much show you their offense you know and so i guess the 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 trick was as long as you're willing to show up and they'll give you a payday and 
they'll put you on for some reason maybe the way i bumped or the way i sold surely wasn't my offensive techniques um i kept getting booked and kept getting booked and then when the whole wcw um luchador started coming around and i guess tv matches got more competitive this would be like 97 ish i'd say 96 to 97 I happened to be there and I got to wrestle much more competitive matches, I'd say, you know, against guys like Dean Malenko and Chris Jericho and uh, Eddie Guerrero and, and, and a lot of other guys. So I literally was there for that whole transition from squash to, hey, man, you're getting 40 percent. He's getting 60. He's going over type of stuff. But the point is, I got to be around enough. And, and I improved enough. I'd go to the power plant and wrestle with those guys and learn from oh, awesome. the, the teacher. Yeah, dude, I Bob Starr, great guy. But he would stay in the hotel. <laughs> he would go to sleep until we had to go to the next town. And I'm like, what are you doing, man? There's a power plant like five minutes from here. But he couldn't care less. And I was like, are you joking? You don't want to go to that place at 10 a.m.? When we don't have to be anywhere till like 5 p.m.? We could go there for four hours and wrestle and learn. He's like, yeah, go ahead if you want to go. And I loved it i mean i loved it man i got i learned a lot those guys were great sarge and pez Watley. i mean those guys really they actually taught me a whole other because i was only a year and a half in maybe they taught me they'd watch me get in the ring I'm like why did you do that and i was like i don't know like i literally didn't know what i was i was doing things that looked good but didn't know why i was doing them and i couldn't answer the question they're like why'd you do that why would you do that and i was like why are you asking me why i, I was literally that so my wrestling school taught me how to fall and how to do holds and how to, but they never, and they just didn't give me what I think I needed to learn. And maybe they just didn't care or they were just busy teaching me moves and they figured I was too unadvanced to know or to need to know this stuff. So when I went to the power plant, they were just drilling me on like, what's this for? Why'd you do that? You gotta do this. Everything's gonna make sense. So there's a lot of learning going on real quick, like real fast. And they were nice enough to let me, cause I guess I was booked on their TV. So I was allowed to do go to their school and train and they had five rings. So as long as you got in a ring, somebody would be there teaching you something. So that was a great experience. A lot of luck. That whole thing was a lot of luck. That whole Bob star booking a bunch of Baltimore kids to come down and just get hammered um, and beat up on TV turned into like, for me, a lot, a lot of learning. It's great. I know you're working there a lot and you're booking, you're using the power plant. What's it like? Like, are you about to get a contract? Did they even talk to you back in the contract? <laughs> no, you know, never? I'd see like guys like Billy Kidman. Oh, you got a job, dude. You came in like me. I'd see guys like uh, Edge would come in and do TV as maybe, I don't know. I don't know if he wrestles on his real name. I don't even think he did. He might've wrestled with Sex and Hardcastle. I'm not sure. I remember meeting a lot of these guys and and uh, and Johnny Swinger would be there and, and Chris Canyon would be there. So you'd see these other guys and they'd get hired. Obviously, Edge went to WWE and got hired. But whatever the case is, a lot of those guys um you know and i tried man but you know they just never said hey they just gave me ta- bookings and and you got the old you know terry taylor became like the guy that booked the tv and he's like he had me on and they they use me every day so we had four tv tapings in a row it might be four shows six shows day one six shows day two six shows they would book like 12 weeks of tv in a matter of i don't know four days in a row then and i would be on every day so i may not be on at 10 11 12 but i'd be on at 10 maybe the next day i'll be on at 11 the next day i'll be on i was always booked so i whatever the reason some guys would sit around and just eat and just get paid to like sit in the locker room and maybe not get a book i always got booked so got lucky in that sense and you know i mean but no no real contract talk i got a welcome aboard speech like hey man we like your stuff welcome aboard and i'm like all right that means something but it wasn't like here's a bunch of money to sit at home and wait for the next tv tapings or anything like that so you know that's so i wish i could lie to you and be like oh yeah but no, there wasn't. There was that. I don't, I don't think they saw me as a potential like champion or some guy they were going to write a bunch of storylines about. I think they just. I, I think Arn Anderson once told me, "You're a good hand, kid. I'll take it. You know, I'm a good hand. You know, you get in there and you take good bumps and you sell well. And when you get the offensive chances, you 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 look you make it look like professional wrestling. So, you know, at that point, I was very happy. I, I two years in the business, three years in the business. I, I don't I don't know where I wanted to be or where I expected to be. I was further along than I know most of my friends were. So that's how I looked at it. So did you ever think about it? Like, oh man, I want to get signed here. Or you didn't even oh, think about it. Yeah, that? no, no. I wanted everybody wants to get signed because I, you know, they were signing here 75 grand a year to just right, right work. Yeah. yeah, more than I was making to do their TV tapings, you know. And I, I had to work odd jobs. I worked in an accounting business with my dad who had his own accountant. I had to get a bouncing gig. So, you know, I had to always have other gigs. So uh I wanted the wrestling to be my only job, but uh, you know. I just kept showing up to work and I was hoping one day I mean, you see other guys get ahead and, you know, and we're like hoping that you would be the next 
guy, but uh, it didn't happen for me at WCW, put it that way. So, you know, Damn. But, that's funny because that's like kind of like the first big foray, right? But then you end up going to WBF for a bit. Were you ever signed to WBF? And, and no, but by, I did. Who luckily, I didn't get signed, but I, a same type of thing, Cornette, uh, Tom Brandy, certain guys would be booking the enhancement talent. And Cornette was great because he'd be like, hey, we're going to be in Philly and Baltimore. I need you for that. And we're also going to be in let's say Worcester and, you know, I'm going to make up another one. We'll say Hartford. And then after that, we're going to be in Long Island and let's say the Meadowlands. So he'd give me six dates all in a row. So I, to me, I was booked. You know what I'm saying? I was like, cool. Yep. I got a Monday and Tuesday. It was like, you know, three weeks in a row. Uh, I was offered a chance to go and I did this. I went with uh, Tom Pritchard and Dory Funk were running little dojos little camps. So guys like Steve Carino were there. I know you and I mentioned this, but I've talked uh, a couple of guys got hired out of there. Jason Arndt. Remember him? He yes. was, uh, yeah. So he was, he was really talented. He was uh, in the mean street posse. Yeah. And, I was uh, say mean street posse. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. Rico got hired. The guy with the big chops. I can't remember what is Casentino, right? Yes. So, so there was a bunch of guys maybe. And I think maybe Chris Daniels in that class. We had a lot of fun. Um, hung out with Mark Henry a lot. Showed me some fun places to hang out in the area. So uh, a lot of learning, a lot of learning. Got promos and stuff, and I failed my promos, man. I hate to say it. As much as I can yap to you, I my promo was terrible. I was wrestling Jason Arnn, and I'm like, hey, man, I can't wait to wrestle you. I've known you for three years, and I've always been your friend. And I was just, it was such a crappy promo. So I feel like <laughs> I feel like Jim Ross was like, man, that's terrible. I don't right. know what he said, but I have a feeling he's like, that's got to be the worst thing ever put on video. So that's what I think anyway. So I think that hurt me a little bit, um, you know, but there's always room for growth. So that the was in 1999. Dojo. Yeah. yeah oh, okay. it was, they would do that up in Connecticut, you know, so they would, and then they would try out guys and, and some dudes got hired and I didn't. But uh, hey, how do you get invited into those camps? Was that Dr. Tom get, getting in? You know what? I would or have JR. to. Good question. So I was doing enough TVs with them. As you like, I tell you, I, I was doing. Remember Super Astraeus? Or was that just like unnecessary for you to watch? Yeah. OK, I so remember I was, it. I didn't watch it too much, but right, I remember right, that so, was on. Yeah. So I was wrestling all these Puerto Rican, Mexican guys, you know, on that show. Luckily, Val Venus could speak Spanish. So I wrestled him on the show. So uh, Julio Sanchez was working his ass off on WWE TV. You would think I had a job. May not win right, a lot. Yeah. But, yeah. You would think. In WCW would, too. Right. Right. You would think this guy's got to be on the payroll. So. um, So I believe from doing enough shows, I guess they said, let's bring him to one of these dojos and see how he does and i bet a lot of it was let's see how he does on the promo and uh and how he gets along with everybody so getting along with people is pretty easy i'm a i'm a pretty easy guy to get along with i like i pretty much like everybody so um so i don't think i rubbed anybody the wrong way but um but i didn't get hired and i also think it could be something to do with i was so booked as an indie worker that i and i probably made a big mistake and those guys will tell me you probably did i kept my indie bookings instead of canceling a couple and going to the five-day camp so instead of going Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we did an indie show Friday and Saturday. I think I came in on a Wednesday or something like that. So I believe, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to turn down my bookings, right? So I believe that could have also been like a pretty bad move. Like a, you know, some guy should have pulled me aside and been like, dude, tell those indie promoters that you'll catch them on the next one. You, how are you not going to be there for the whole thing? So right. those two things could have been, my promo sucked. And then of course the guy shows up in the middle of the whole thing and acts like he's big league of people. I'm not big league of people. I'm just keeping my bookings and you know, whatever dude. Yeah. You know, you learn as you live, you know what I'm saying? So I think those two things that had something to do with it. I probably had everything to do with it to be honest with you. So, you know, do you remember some matches you had for WBF, like Shotgun Saturday Night against Vader, Kurt Angle? Do you remember any of those? I wrestled Kurt Angle. I remember seeing the veins in his legs and being very, very impressed with him physically. I was like, holy crap, I've never had a vein in my leg before. So I was kind of like, wow. Uh, Vader, very, I wrestled him in WCW and WBF, and I think yes. he told the WBF guys that I liked wrestling him, so put me in with him. So I don't remember the moonsault that everyone talks about that he did on me, which must have been pretty impressive, but I – I don't remember it. I just don't. And I don't remember a lot of matches. I can. Did he I, stiff you at all? No. And here's how it was. Bob Starr gave me some good advice when I wrestled in WCW. He hits people in the mouth with his gloves if they don't sell. So I said, okay, well, I don't want that. <laughs> so <laughs> right. I, I freaking, dude, if he hit me in the ribs, 
I launched myself. I almost sat on the top turnbuckle in the corner because he hit me in the rib so hard. I launched myself. I just knew that if I make him look like he's hurting me, he won't really hurt me. So I knew. I just didn't. Thank God Bob Starr told me. I'm always, I always cared about selling and making it look real. And always, I never, I never undersold stuff. But some guys didn't have that skill. You know what I mean? So he would yep. beat the crap out of him because if you don't sell for me, I'm going to punch in the lips and then you either will sell that or you'll just be bloody. So I just avoided that. And then again, when I went to WF, I wrestled him again. And, uh, you know, I don't, I think he also, remember the razor's edge? He actually spun me like a propeller in midair and let me land on the ground. So he did a bunch of crazy shit to me, but, uh, but you know, um, I mean, I did so many matches for WF. It's ridiculous. If you were to waste your time and go to YouTube and just put in Julio Sanchez, not De Niro or Fantastico, there's just ridiculous amounts of like WCW and WF. I mean, so many. It's just, it's actually kind of crazy to think about it now. Back then, it was just another day at the office. I was just going to work. But um, when I think about it now, I mean, I wrestled a lot of a lot of people I really uh, looked up to and learned a lot from. To be honest with you, I wrestled Kurt Henning in his first WCW match just so he can get used to the ring and uh, really? never aired. Wow. Yeah. I remember drop kicking him in the mouth, and Terry Tony goes, "Dude, you drop kick Kurt Hang in the mouth." I'm like, "Yeah, it's a wrestling match. What do you mean to drop kick him in the chest? I could, if I kick you in the mouth, I'll kick you in the mouth." So, uh, but I remember, and I remember he and I had some stuff we talked about, and uh, and and it didn't happen. So, in other words, we kind of had some stuff we discussed, and I think he was appeasing me in the locker room, <laughs> but he knew I had 500 matches to his 5,000, and that 500, I thought I had done something. I was like, "Dude, I've had 500 matches. Like, I'm freaking awesome." He's like, oh, I've had 5,000. I just thought about it. I was like, whoa, that's crazy. Like, that's 500 to me sound like a lot. And hit to him, it just was like, okay, rookie, you little jabroni. You know what I mean? Like, you <laughs> suck, dude. I did 500 matches in my first year and a half in the business. You know what I mean? I was doing, you know, he probably worked seven days a week at one point. So, you know, I thought I had been some, I had thought I, and a lot of times I just, that was my problem, I think, in the business. Not that I didn't like work with people and I say, like, I just, I already thought I was there in a lot of ways. And I just, my mentality was always like, I'm with you guys. And even though they were like, no, you're really not. I didn't know. I just thought I was. I was like, oh, yeah, okay. 500 matches, dude. Let's go do this thing. So, you know, then you find out differently as, as you, uh, as you, as you mature and you, yes. uh, you know, talk to more people, learn more. What are the differences backstage between WCW at this point and WWF at that point? Good question. Um, Good question. All right, let me go ahead and see if I can make it right. So the WCW TV teams were like usually at um, center stage in Atlanta, or they'd be at the Universal uh, Studios. That? Yeah, some one of those places, right? So it was a very sterile environment. Or MGM too. Yeah. Yes, right, right. So you had a big room to get dressed in and stuff like that. And then occasionally, what you do is you do your Saturday night tapings at like Macon or Dothan or one of these towns where it was more like a real arena, and you're like, oh, cool, it's a little different. Uh, so you'd get you'd, you'd had like the TV taping town, Saturday night taping, but they'd always go to like these other one-off towns to film like, I don't know, WCW worldwide or whatever. So um, I, I'm trying to think of how, how I could explain the difference. So a lot of it was how the TV tapings were set up. Um, and, and again, not being like a somebody or a superstar, like to me, they were very similar. I think we had catering at both places. They had a thing on the wall with who's wrestling who. And they all, everyone had a little bit of an agent type of stuff. So for me, it really wasn't that big of a difference. They were very similar um, in, in that sense for what I was having to do on the shows for just showing up. You got this guy, you got this amount of time. We need this in the match and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, so it's fairly, I wish I could give you like this stark difference. Cause I know, you know, when you watch other guys talk, who've been around and like, were stars, you're like, one place was disorganized and haphazard. And the other place was just like, you were at work. It was a business as you, you know, it was like all perfect. And you know, everything was like really thought out and planned. So I, but for me really show up, you got this match this time. And, and, and when you're done, you know, collect and you know see it next time so you know i don't i don't i don't have a whole lot of differences to be totally honest with you in my head nothing really sticks out as as majorly different for what i did so did you work nitro tapings and raw tapings or just the other taping no i like actually did nice raw stuff? tapings obviously uh, but a lot of times you wouldn't be on raw i might get a saturday night what's that sunday night show they have sunday night sunday heat. Heat. yeah i got a couple of those uh i did and i would just do like the estrellas or the shotgun saturday nights for for WCW, I probably never got on Nitro or Thunder, but of course I get on the Saturday Night Show or the Worldwide or the uh, WCW Pro shows like that. So, but we would go, be invited to those shows to if we wanted to hang out and hope for a booking or hope for a dark match or whatever. And, you know, there was a lot of a lot of dark matches. So I got to do Madison Square Garden with Jason Art, 
And uh, I got a house show run with WCW because Bill Buff Bagwell missed a flight. So luckily I got to work Scotty Riggs in Baltimore arena. And then they had to finish the loop. So it might've been a Friday in Baltimore, a Saturday in Pennsylvania and a Sunday in Morgantown, West Virginia. So we, uh, so I got like a three day loop with WCW just by showing up to the Baltimore arena to, to just watch. So, um, so yeah, so that, that happened once. <laughs> that was fun. I remember back in those days too, like they'd have Sunday Night heat tapings just by itself and it would sell out. We'd do like 20,000 people there for yeah. Sunday Night heat. Obviously they throw in like, Hey, dark match with Steve Austin or dark match. With right. The right. They throw that. Yeah. So, but you were like, wow, Sunday Night heat 20,000 people here for, for this. Wow. Yeah, I, and that's surprising. Cause I, my memory is not as clear as yours. I didn't know that Sunday night heat had its own set of TV teams. I just thought it was shoved in the whole plethora. At, of at stuff one point, I guess, I guess it got so popular at one point, like 90, late 98, 99. Right. It got so popular. They, they would sometimes do the taping by itself. Sometimes they'd lump it in, or it'd be before, obviously, a pay per view or something. But right. Because some, they did they, Monday they, and Tuesday, right? Is yep. that how they would do it? Monday Raw, and then Tuesday would be SmackDown. Usually, they, usually they taped it. Yep, on Tuesday. And and it wasn't SmackDown wasn't live until maybe it went to like a Friday. Is that possibly true? Right. So before SmackDown happened, they would have the the heat tapings. So I guess when SmackDown right. came along, then heat became less of a thing and and less important. But yeah. back before that, when heat was like right. wow, one hour of heat. TV, if he went right for whatever reason they would sell out big venues yeah just i remember when i got my first heat booking all- i was like really like i was like, hey you're running on heat night i'm like really like i'm doing heat like that's a real show like i was kind of like surprised i think i wrestled steve blackman or something like that but it was i was nice. just like wow i didn't think i'd get on it i just didn't i didn't think i'd get on a heat taping that's pretty cool so back then i was that was i was totally stoked to do heat i was like that's a big deal so better than shotgun saturday night or whatever else whatever whatever we were doing back then superstars or whatever yeah so when you're there, do you have any like connection or any talks with Vince, or is it strictly the agents? No way, that? dude. Hey, Vince, I'm Brian Wall. Nice to meet you. He'd be like, "Get out of here, kid." Uh, no, I never did that. But I'm saying, yeah, give, he, give me a yeah. shot. Give me a dude. Count. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I and just from my knowledge of just watching some other interviews, I feel like when you got Vince's ear, you were at the top. You had to have a. Right. You had to be like the champ. Nobody else. They, even the guys who were Intercontinental Champion and Tag Team, they weren't talking to Vince McMahon. They just weren't. He only had time with with. Who's got the belt? Who's the main focus? And then I'm going to deal with you because I want to make sure this goes right. All that other crap, hopefully those guys are doing their job. But he always, you know, was going to make sure that the champion or the top angle was going to be done right because he's going to he's going to be the agent for that. And I felt like everything else, somebody else was handling that kind of stuff. So, yeah, he and we may have talked. We may have, you know, said hi or whatever, <laughs> catering. Uh, but, you know, but I don't, I, was, I wasn't going to approach him as if, that was going to somehow lead to something. I figured he'd just call security on me if I did something like that, you know? <laughs> Ever any thought of like getting a contract there? We're talking about WCW. What about WCW oh, getting a contract? Yeah, sure. When Joey, I Abs that, is, Joey Abs is getting one. I mean, come on. Right. So, Joey Mercury, one of my buddies. I mean, a lot of guys got, I used to work with the Hardys and, and Hurricane in North Carolina before we all got, you know, up a little further along. So, yeah. And I did. I went to that thing with the dojo with funk and and so that was a shot that was to me that was like again maybe i was an idiot and i was like i should have just gone to the, i should have taken i should have said like oh i got this booking i'm gonna finish that out i'll show up a little late you know i just was, was flipping about the whole thing you know i just yep. uh, i didn't really you know and i went to college i got a degree i knew i'd fall on my feet whether wrestling worked out or not so most guys are probably like dude if i don't do this wrestling thing my freaking life's gonna fall apart or i'm gonna you know end up working at a gas station i don't know whatever people think they're gonna do so i i i'm very uh i don't want to say laid back but you know whatever i don't know i can't explain it. i just i didn't have to worry i never worried about my future in any way like wrestling is great i want to do it i wanted to be a wrestler i wanted to be i i wanted to be wrestling create a superstar i had you know i want to do all that crap but you know at the same time i you know i figured i'd do something else if, if it didn't pan out so i should have probably taken it a little more seriously honestly right. i like i like the wrestling part i love getting in the ring um and doing that, I enjoyed it. Um, but you know, there's a lot of other aspects to it than what you do inside the squared circle. And I don't think I was totally good at all those aspects. I just, there's, you know, I could probably write a book on what not to do in professional wrestling too. You know, so yeah. yeah. So how did you end up in ECW? Good question. Um, you know what? I was. Uh, they came to DC, so I lived in washington dc area they came and did a tv taping there and they did another one in virginia and i knew simon diamond from pennsylvania championship wrestling and he probably also did those shows we did in delaware for ecwa and he might have even been on the new jack city show so 
I knew him. He was there. I knew Steve Carino. So he was there. Uh, I knew Donnie B. And I also knew Nova. So Nova was there. Um, I'm sure I ran into some of those guys also when they would do the one-off when they weren't on the ECW shows, but they'd pick up a Thursday booking or a Sunday booking, I'd be on those shows. So I know a handful of people. And um, I think I must have just invited myself or got an invite to go there. And and someone must, or maybe I said, hey, I'm, you guys are going to be in my area. Can someone put a good word in for me? And somehow I got a, I got booked. I might have worked um, Grimes. Remember Grimes? Oh, yeah. Nick Grimes. Grimes. Yeah. Nice and then kid. I might have worked Chili Willie. <laughs> so, I, yeah, he was great, dude. So I worked Rick Grimes in D.C. and Chili Willie. Real competitive, you know, the ECW didn't, no one gets squashed there. Everybody's going to put on a false finish fest and everyone's going to almost win six times before they go home. You know, they, they, every match was like a main event. No one knew, no one had any idea that the first guy in the show and the third guy in the show are not as important as the last guy in the show. We all were trying to be Rob Van Dam and work our asses off. So, uh, so, you know, I got two shots there and then they said, Hey, when you, when can you start? And Christian York and Joy Matthews were neighborly of me. They were like within an hour so I figured I had three guys, two guys I could ride with. So I started working with them, and that's it. I did a couple shows for them, local, and I mean it was really kind of relaxed as well. Just you know, and I didn't have where else to go. There was WWF wasn't calling. I was just gonna keep doing TV teams the rest of my life, and I kind of got it. I don't want to do that all my whole life, you know. I mean that's cool. There's nothing wrong with it, but you know I've been doing it a while, and I was probably like ninety nine ish, maybe two thousand ish. So now I've been five years in. So I figured I'd learned enough to, you know, take up a a spot or you know a decent spot on a stage like ECW. I got you know so I felt very comfortable there and it was a good time. It was a good year. I'd say a good year over there. Good time. Great place yep. to work. When you enter, I guess you're Julio Sanchez or Julio Fantastico. I think I switched over to Fantastico because I had recently done the Heroes of Wrestling in October of ninety nine and I started working with them in real early two thousand. Might have even done my first two tryout matches maybe in very early two thousand. So I just used the Fantastico moniker. And then we turned into the De Niro because I was teaming up with Easy Money. Remember him? Yeah. Awesome. Jason Jett. Oh, yeah. Jason yep. Jett. Jet, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, Jason Spence. But, yeah. So yeah. I started teaming up with him, and he was Easy Money. I said, well, why don't we just change it to Julio De Niro? And, and then we had Chris Hamrick. And who was our lady manager? Oh, my God. Come on. Help me out. Electra? Electra. Yeah, dude. You're awesome. So, uh, yeah, we did that. And that was a, that was a blast. Hot Commodity was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun with that. That was what was like Paul's thought on that? Like, I'm just going to have like, everybody has to do something with money, but like easy money is kind of like the stripper. Electra literally is a strip. Like yeah. what was the thought process on that? Cause obviously Hambrick's like, kind of like, like that, like dirty money kind of guy. Yeah. You're like the clean cut kind of. Yeah. You know, guy. And, and to think about what it was, in my opinion was, um, I don't think they knew they were going to team us up when we first got there, but I think they figured they needed the tag team. So it all kind of just kind of, gelled accidentally because i was doing my own thing in my first got there but quickly enough they were like why don't we team new guys up or maybe they just do us together for fun uh, on some event i'm not even sure and then and then uh but yeah i think when i changed my name to narrow i just did that on my own and uh but i thought it would fit in better and then he became chris confederate currency chris hamrick and you know so i'm not sure we just had that it, and I hate to say this, but it wasn't that thought out. I mean, it wasn't as if there was a board meeting with Paul Heyman and he's got this scheme. We were almost like how Vince was, and he dealt with the champions. Paul Heyman didn't deal with us, man. We had Tommy Dreamer was our he was our Jim Ross. He was our talent relations guy. Tommy, what's going on with this? You know, Tommy would come to us, and Paul Heyman was way up, you know, kind of in not in the clouds to say hi to him, but he didn't come to us and be like, I got this idea. Tommy did a lot of the work. I mean, Tommy, dude, every promo we did, I mean, Tommy was there just hammering us, making sure we said the right thing. It was so, you know, I don't want to make it seem as if Paul Heyman and I and, and everybody strategized this tag team thing. It really wasn't that, uh, you know, that put together, so to speak. A How bit was more. Paul? Like, what did you think about Paul? Um, Paul was really nice. I noticed and he's, he he would he would congratulate you or say something cool when he thought you did something that was special. So, you know, if I did a flying leap over the top rope and crashed down and got an ECW chant. Like I could see him like he would be happy about that stuff so he was cool i mean i you know but again i didn't deal with him like that often like you know but so i don't have like a whole i was an rvd and i just didn't have to we didn't have a lot of conversations it wasn't he wasn't one of my you know, i don't think i ever had this phone number <laughs> so you know, really? just, yeah i don't think i ever had to call him for any reason you know so but he was cool i mean he was i was happy he gave me a shot i mean so i just looked at paul like thanks i looked at paul was thank you because he didn't have to hire me he could have been like whatever dude there's a thousand guys like you out there i don't need you 
You know, I could hire Tom Carter. Reckless Youth could be doing the same thing you're doing. So I was just happy to have a spot. Trent Asset, there was a lot of great guys that didn't get hired there. So, you know, for whatever reason. So he could have hired anybody. So I was happy were that you, I got the spot. Were you technically under contract for ECW? Dude, I doubt it. I, I don't remember <laughs> signing any pieces of paper, man. There's money in a bag at this TV taping. Get there. You know what I mean? Oh, there's money on this pay-per-view. Can you make it to this town? I'm like, well... All right, Joey and Christian, you want to make a trip to Green Bay, Wisconsin? And we just said, yeah, why not? You know, we got on the show. So we could have said no. We could have been like, I'm not making that show. He didn't fly me to Green Bay. You know what I mean? I just had to drive there. So, uh, I, you know, a lot of it was, I had to say, it was very laissez fair in a lot of ways. It wasn't as organized as you'd think, you know. Just everybody wanted to be on their television show, though. All of us just wanted, where else are we going to get exposure from? So that's how I looked at it. I need exposure. So I'm coming to your, where's the camera and where's the show? And I'm showing up. And that's just how it was with me. I mean, there could have been guys. I don't. I wasn't high on the card. I mean, we may have got a. We may have got a shot at tag team titles. We may have had opportunity to become tag champs if the company stayed around a while. But you know, I don't. I never look at myself like I was like somehow very important to the product. I mean, if I didn't show up one day, I. I that's just me not being. Probably just me just being more modest. But I mean, you know, they would have probably wanted me to be there, and I'm. You know, but I don't know. They wouldn't have freaked out if I didn't show up. They would just work. They would have put Hamrick in my spot. All right, Hamrick, you're gonna wrestle Easy Money and. Electro will be at ringside. We had four people in our group. So, no. with ECW too, it was obviously very different. What was the atmosphere like there? Because it seems like they always talk about, oh, backstage is nuts. Everybody loved each other, but it, it was crazy. You know, everybody's partying. Not that they didn't take it seriously. They just took it to another level where they were just, you know, it was not a corporate environment. I mean, they could do no. There they was wanted. a lot of so so my group of guys, so, and not not all of them. I mean, Easy Money and I. And Hamrick, I don't, I mean, Hamrick, they may have, I don't, certain guys definitely smoke pot. And those guys would get together when the show was over, wherever we were, and they'd find a spot in the building or right outside and they'd get spliffed out before we go to the next town or go to the hotel right. or do whatever. I did that in high school. So I was already out of that stage in my life. I didn't <laughs> care. I was, I don't want to get high. I paranoid when I get high or whatever. You know, I just was like, eh, it's, I did it already. I just didn't see the point. In it. So there was a lot of guys that did that. And I know there was other guys that did other stuff like drank and, you know, pilled and, and coked, but I was, and I drank, don't get me wrong, but I just, but I just, uh, it was around, you know, but I can't, I don't want to lie and be like, I saw lines on a table or I saw, you know, this or that. I mean, you know, maybe it was, you know, some guys would be drinking uh, some liquor in the locker room, you know what I mean? When they were done working or maybe before they worked, I don't know, they just have a little bit to take the pain off before they get hit in the head with a cane for all I know, you know? So, uh, so it was visible. It was around, you know, I didn't get in, I can't tell you I saw a lot or, or looked for it or was involved in that. And I'm not a goody two shoes by any means. I've broken lots of, uh, rules, but I just, uh, I was already done with that part of my life when it came to that kind of stuff. You know, I just already, I did all that. I was old past it, you know, done with it. So I missed a lot of that. Was it a very friendly atmosphere though behind the besides like the crazy and stuff? Was everybody like pulling for each other? Yeah, I would say this when you're brand brand new there, mm, you know, find somebody you like and someone you know and get close to them in the locker room. So I I had worked with New Jack, luckily, in Texas. Remember that we talked about uh Tom Pritchard and, and Dory Funk? Well, I did a show in Texas. I didn't feel like ditching that show, so should have told those guys. I got to come back another time. Sorry about your plane ticket, but I didn't. But I met New Jack on that show, and we had fun. We got, be pick, we got picked up at the same airport. We came from, like, Houston to some town called Lufkin. I don't know if that was a two-hour ride. We were both in the car. We hung out there. Luckily, when I got to ECW, I had already known him. So he was cool. He remembered me as a jokester. I was making fun of everything when we were on that car ride. So I cracked him up, and luckily I made him laugh. So I feel like when you make someone laugh, then you can – you, 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 it breaks the ice. So, um, but I feel like in the beginning, everyone kind of is looking at you like either you're taking a spot or, you know, and, but I feel like after a couple of months, everybody's pulling for everybody, you know, but I remember some, sometimes a little weird going to a bar and seeing like, so I saw Chris Chetty once and I was like, what's up booster. And he was like, what's a booster. And I was like, Oh man. So you think these guys are going to, but as, as time went on, I, if I see Chris Chetty today, we're friendly. He's cool. I see him sometimes in construction sites in, in Queens, New York, believe it or not. Um, he works for a construction company that we rent to. So, um, so, but at oh, first, yeah, it's a little, it's a, yeah, it's a little, sometimes a little, you know, I didn't know everybody. So sometimes there's, it's a little standoffish. I think once though, you've been there a couple months, let's put it that way. And, 
They've worked with you. I worked the Baldies. I worked with uh, Kid Cash. Once they've worked with you, I feel like once you've run through that whole system of house show, TV taping, pay-per-view, yeah, everyone's pulling for you. But when I was first there, I kind of was like, I don't know. I couldn't just be as comfortable as I wanted to be. I feel like you know certain guys would didn't know how to take you or they didn't want to be cool. So you learned as you went along. But I think once you're there a little while, then everybody was pulling for each other. We all we all knew this was like our only place to work. So we didn't want it to fall apart. We knew we needed each other to have good matches. So, you know, and 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 getting along with everybody was important to me. I remember Easy Money would always get his hot moves in. We're the bad guys and he's doing backflips and he's and he's picking guys up and throwing them in midair and flopping them on the ground and makes himself look great. And none of the baby faces hate us because one of my partners is showing off ridiculously and trying to get over with the crowd when he should be getting heat with the crowd. So I did the job of getting the heat and I always had to play that guy because I was like, he's doing all the flashy crap. I got to do all the mean crap. But then the fans look at you like you're a loser because you're not doing anything flashy. But I got this idiot doing all the flashy crap. If I do flashy crap, no one's going to want to work with us. So yep. kind of a crazy scenario. We got through it. But, you know, I, you know, I had to figure out people just didn't like working with us, I think, because one of us. <laughs> <laughs> was Not very stuff, yeah. very athletic and very interested in you know getting the the tom tom in or you know did some crazy stuff dude great great athlete for his size great athlete but should have waited till we were baby faces maybe to do half of the stuff he was doing but you know he didn't know any better he was just having fun and he paul loved that crap so in that sense paul kind of fueled that fire where you have a psychology but then also popping people or getting the crowd to give a shit about a little section of a match, Paul liked that. He liked when the crowd was interested in in something, even if it was a bad guy doing it. He he liked the pop or the reaction, you know. So I'd like to build towards the reaction at the end of the match. But money would like to get reactions all through the match. So we kind of had a different mentality, but I had to deal with him. He was my partner, and I knew he was he was pretty pretty well liked um, by Paul. So I you know I can't fight him all the time about psychology. It's a little old. So that how you. How you doing, Booster? Is that a Jerky Boys reference to uh, Hell yeah, Canada? dude. We used to Jerky Boys on the road all the time, yeah. man. How so, yeah, we loved Booster? that. Yeah. yeah, we loved it, dude. <laughs> so, so I would walk up and say that to people. And like I said, I remember Chetty looking at me at a bar. It was the first time we ever saw, hung out with each other outside of uh, – he's like, Booster, who you calling Booster? And I'm like, oh, and then I mentioned the whole Jerky Boys thing. And he, you know, he just didn't want to get – he didn't want us walking in as newbies looking at him like he's not – you know, like, you know, he wanted some respect. So, But yeah. I wasn't being disrespectful. I was just being funny. So, you know. So they're gonna walk that line, awesome. yeah, yeah. But but I still want to hear them. I haven't heard them in a long time, but I still like them. They're awesome. I still they use were... plenty of their references all the oh, time. Still, twenty five years later, I'm still laughing about stuff that they said. So, it's awesome. Always, if somebody like you just said, "How you doing?" I immediately, like, "How you doing, Booster?" Yeah, yeah, I was on yeah. the Palisades Parkway, and I think like Palisades Parkway, boom. You know when uh, he, oh right, right, right. That awesome uh, call where he's saying, "Hit me with some Palisades funny Parkway. shit," right? Yeah. When he goes, <laughs> "Deputy," yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly, dude. That was awesome. You got those flappy tits? No, I do not. I'm like, that's all. Yeah, that stuff's great. And the guy, he goes, oh, you want to buy a lawnmower? And the Asian guy's like, yes, I want to buy a lawnmower. He goes, okay, what you want? to Push behind or a ride on? Oh, I'd like to get to ride on. Oh, you was a lazy motherfucker. I'm like, no way. He hit that. <laughs> Just yes. killing people, man. That is That stuff was awesome. So funny, Love man. It. Like, Yeah, just great stuff. And then I see my nine and eight-year-old. When the when the telemarketers call my house, they're not as vulgar as that. But then they use that as an excuse to like just bash them. I'm like, it's funny, but can't you just hang up on those guys. Yeah, yeah they like get them it. on the horn, like, hey, and they're like, <laughs> the telemarketer's like, dude, where's your dad? They're like, hey, blah, blah, blah. like just leave them alone. They crank call the telemarketers to call my house. It's funny. It reminds me of Bert Jerky Boys. I try not to get yes. too mad at them. But, yes, yeah, it's kind of funny. Johnny Brennan was supposed to be touring. Literally, I think it was like last week, and everything got canceled. I don't know if the venue, something happened. I was like, oh, I thought the Jerky Boys were back, and they're not. They teased me. All right. Well, I, I and, screwed. and don't hate me, but I couldn't, I don't, I can't tell you who any of them are, honestly. So, so you know them better than I do. I just remember laughing at them, but I never looked up yeah. who they were and what their name Johnny are. and Kamal. Did you never seen the movie, Jerky Boys? Probably not, but I will oh. now. Hold on, writing it down. Yep. All right. I'll, yeah, it's, it's great. How, when did it come out? A long time ago? 1993 ish, I want to say. It was, it was, <laughs> That's it was so funny. funny. <laughs> yeah, I'll check it out. It's not great, but I love it because it's them. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'll in, check yeah. it out. Sure. Why not? I'll definitely Obviously, it's not as good as the, the prank calls, but no. All right. Well, that's cool. I'll still watch it. Yeah, those are great, great guys. I'm glad you, glad you, glad you noticed that. So, yeah. Love them. Yeah. So, 
with ECW, you work in November to Remember, you work in a Massacre in 34th Street, right. you work in Guilty as Charged, I mean, you work in all the pay-per-views and stuff. Are you shocked when they go out of business? Are you shocked when they're no Good. longer around? You know what's funny? Yeah, we did like a TV, we did a pay-per-view, I want to say it was January 7th, and they said, all right, we're going to be in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and like somewhere in Missouri the following yep. week. I don't even know where these places are, dude. I'm just like, huh. So, and I had a, I think we ended up meeting up with Sandman in Memphis. I don't even know what happened there and driving him somewhere. So it was like, you know, so that was an experience I'll never forget. Sandman on the road was pretty impressive. So when you talk about certain things that happen and what happened to backstage, I'm like, oh, I'm all past that, you know, but, but I rode with him and uh, very impressive. The, the amount of activity he could um, partake in and survive is crazy so uh so so that was our last day and i think we found out then i want to say that so we didn't i may not have even known at the pay-per-view january 7th i found out like the weekend of hey man we're, we don't have anything else next week and i'm like what so we did like a toast in the you know everybody drank a beer or whatever in the built at the in the ring at the last day of the tv teams there was some crying going on and we were just like huh but there was always this chance that fred durst from from that rock band. I don't even know what they're Limp called. Limp Biscuit. Limp Biscuit. Thank you very much. I'm I'm more into technical metal and jazz fusion and progressive rock. So I like musicians that like practice all day and they're nerdy about it. So I don't really care about uh new metal or, or usually popular rock. But they said he was gonna probably partake in somehow reviving our company. So we always thought there was a shot, but I needed to work. I did a WWF TV taping. And who walks in? Paul Heyman. And Tom Pritchard was talking to me earlier in the day. I'm like, well, there's a chance that maybe there's gonna, they're going to revive the organization. And, you know, Fred Durst is going to be. And then Paul Heyman walks in and goes, I don't think there's a chance of that happening anymore. And I was like, oh, my God. So, so I remember being there for that. And that was like the seal. That would have been two or three months later. But that was like the big seal. And then I tried to get Paul to give me a job. I remember uh, uh, Matt Hardy. He had like a little minion crew. Probably, uh, who's the guy with the mohawk from Moorefield, North Carolina? Come on, Matt Hardy's buddy. Oh, Shannon Moore. Shannon Moore. Shannon Moore, right? So he had him, and and I don't know if he had anybody else, but I was like, Paul, get me a job. I just, I'll be Matt's minion. And Paul goes, You're way too good for that. No way. We're going to do something better with you. And I'm like, Oh my God, <laughs> he lied to me. <laughs> the first thing I know is he finally lied to me. I never, never thought about Paul's a liar. I was like, Oh my God, he lied right to my face. You're too good for that. I'm like, dude, I'm not too good for that. I need a gig, dude. I'm not too good for that. I, I wouldn't be asking for that if I was too good for that. So that was funny. That was the first time I remember him lying to me in my face. <laughs> like, you're too good for that. And I was like, what are you kidding me? I'll take anything. Give me a job. So that was not that he even had the power to do that. I don't even know if he was, he was probably just talent at that point. I'm not really sure. But um, I, I would imagine they hired him to write. But um, but you know, that was. That was that. So, you know, but what was your original question? I feel like I went on a tangent. Well, they ended. They, you, we kind of answered the question, though, that they were you shocked at all that DCW is over because it's like, okay, there's a chance, there's a chance. Oh, uh, you know, gone. And obviously, when Heyman shows up, it's over. I kind of remember at the TV, the, at the, you call it TV, TV, at the pay per view event, there was word of it, you know, that it was, that was some, I keep shaking. There was word that, um, that there was some financial issues. And I remember hearing something in the back area, like some backstage stuff about um, he had to wait too long to get paid for the pay-per-views we were doing. So even if they were doing good buys, there was like this lag. And as all the business bull crap of it keeps going, like there's no way to fund it anymore. It was kind of like, and who knows, maybe in three or four months, he'd get this monthly windfall from the pay-per-view to cover some crap, you know? So, you know, I didn't really have a deal. And I didn't make a lot of money there. So like when, when people were like, I had to sue Paul or I had to do a, I don't even think I even got involved in that class action lawsuit. That certain, I, dude, he didn't owe me crap. Dude. Every time I showed up, I got paid. He didn't owe me a thing. Even I think the last weekend I got paid. I, at least I, I don't remember him. Owing, I was going to chase that guy for a few thousand dollars, you know? So, I mean, for some people, maybe a few thousand dollars was like rent, but I always live beyond my, below my means. So like, I didn't need his money. I wasn't like worried about that. Was, even if he did owe me some money, I didn't wasn't enough for me to care about, you know? So, yep. um, but yeah, so it was kind of interesting and it kind of came out of nowhere, but then the last week is when everyone kind of noticed or found out about it. So, you know, that's so surprising, you know, it didn't feel like anyone leading up to it. So obviously WCW 
is over right after that. So there's no WCW, there's no right. ECW, there's only WWE. Did you ever think about heading back there? I know you worked at one of the tapings and stuff. Yeah, Did you I ever think about I, going back there? I will. Obviously, I'm not, I don't have an ego. So like, I remember I worked back for them a bunch. I remember 2005 even, I already had my job where I'm at now. Um, and I did a TV taping. I wrestled, who was it, Fit Finley. And he had Hornswoggle, and we had this fun TV match. Was awesome. I mean, but but it didn't air on TV the way it's supposed to. Like in, in the arena, it's like Atlantic City. We used fire extinguishers, shillelaghs. We had freaking there was all kinds of chaos. But when you watch on television, they edited it down so it looked like not as cool as it was to the live audience. Right. But but so even in two thousand five, I had already gone back there to TVs. I remember seeing like Chris Jericho, who I'd seen in WCW and years earlier. And, uh, and, and we were friendly and he's like, you're still doing this. Like, in other words, dude, you were like 10 years in, you're still getting your ass handed to you on TV tapings. I remember CM Punk was there after we had done the TNA thing. I know you probably think I'm jumping the gun, but, and then we were friendly and, it was, and, and, and again, he didn't say anything like that, but I just remember, you know, I didn't care, dude. If I, if someone's going to pay me a, some money to work on a Monday or a Tuesday, what have I got better to do? I have a job. I can take a day off and go do that. So I, I never, I don't know. I don't really I would go there happily and work. I didn't think about it like my ego is damaged or I'm better than that. I didn't care, dude. You gave me some money to wrestle or half the time just eat, <laughs> like hang out <laughs> on catering and watch, see my friends that I know from the business. So, you know, that's just the way I looked at it. I did try to get over there a few times. And I was in between XPW and TNA and, um, you know, whatever. You know, if I was doing XPW or TNA, I wouldn't go there to do TV tapings. That would be wrong. I had a contract with TNA. But but any anywhere when I was in between anything, I – I had no problem going there and picking up some money. You know, I, that's how I looked at it. It was a business. I was it's just work. You're going to yep. pay me to wrestle. I'll, I love wrestling. You know, if I didn't have a job and three kids and I'd be wrestling right now, probably for somebody somewhere. So, you know, I didn't so, think of it in any weird way. So how'd you get into TNA? Speaking of TNA, because you got a good spot with the gathering, Alexis Lurie, Raven, hmm. eventually CM Punk. That's a good question. I know I would keep telling you that whenever you ask me a question, I'm like, cause I don't always know the answer to this. So I'm trying to, how'd I get over there? You know, I think I don't even know when that started. Um, I'm not sure if I went in for just a one-off. I maybe they were allowing people to come down there if you knew somebody and just show up and do a dark match or get beat up on TV. I'm not really 100 percent sure. I must have gone there once. Maybe it's like I think they were allowing you to go if an indie guy had a wanted to go there and work. I think they would give people a shot. Um, so I must have just asked the right person. Okay, can you get me in? Uh, or do a TV taping. I remember going there for some reason. And I wish I could tell you who I wrestled in my first match there. It just doesn't ring a bell. But uh, but I remember maybe Raven was there and he said, hey, man, I could use you as a, as a, you know, like a minion or whatever. And I was like, sure, I'll do that. You know, because I just came there to work. I might have wrestled somebody and don't remember anything about it. But um, and and I it was a and I think it maybe within a couple weeks like I was there all the time and I remember Mickey James was to come right around the same time so we got the little gig and then at some point CM Punk showed up and we've pictured I think he might have wrestled CM Punk at ROH or something so he said we could use him and so we we all formed them together but how I got there in the beginning I don't remember I want to say I just did a tryout or something and you know luckily Raven needed some humans. And uh, I was willing to, <laughs> he needed somebody to make him look like a star. So I was cool. Again, my ego, I'm like, whatever, dude, I'll do anything you want, you know? So I'll just back you up and do whatever you need to do and make you look like the superstar. And if I got to take an ass kicking at your expense or, or I take an ass kicking to help you, then I'll do it. So that's kind of what I remember about that. Pretty cool spot. I mean, obviously you, Punk, Raven, Alexis Lurie, like I mentioned, but when it's you, Punk, and Raven feuding with Shane Douglas and the Disciples of the New Church, it was very interesting. It was very cool. It was different because it's like, okay, TNA has got these X Division guys, but then they got the main eventers and Douglas and Raven. Then they got the other guys who can work. They're right. intermingled with them. So yes, it's, yes. it's like a good combination. It was a lot of fun. And they gave they gave us a lot of matches. But they had that other show called Explosion. So I remember even if we didn't have anything special to do on the two-hour pay-per-view, or maybe if we did, maybe we'd wrestled twice a night. But uh, I remember we did a lot. Dude, there's so much stuff on so many guys we wrestled like that I forgot about. But my friends will be like, hey, do you remember this match? I was like, no. But, you know, we wrestled so many guys and um, in tag team matches. And, again, and it was even before – we started running through the end. There was a time in the end where they kept bringing all these like extreme wrestling guys, ECW yeah. guys that wrestled. So it was going to be like Sam Man and Mikey Whipwreck. And then it'd be like Balls Mahoney and blah, blah, blah. And then eventually it was like Terry Funk and this guy. And and yep. 
it was it was cool because like I know to me it was just another day at the office. I mean I just but when I look back at it, it was like we wrestled a lot of cool dudes. We had a lot of good wins or whatever. We were marching forward. And I don't know if this is near the end when we were already feuding with Raven and you're back at the part where we were together. But the whole experience of TNA was a lot of fun. I mean I really really enjoyed it. It was you know one week one once a week on a Wednesday it was great because you could still do your Thursday Friday Saturday Sunday and pick up that Wednesday check and. It was a lot of fun. It was you got on the you got on the road. You got you got a flight. You you spent the night. We party with all our friends. Sometimes I wouldn't even go to sleep. I would just stay up all night until until we caught the plane ride home from Nashville to Baltimore. And I mean, I remember there was one time. Remember OJ Simpson's commercial? Or how old are you? I'm I'm way in my upper forties. How old are you? Thirty nine. All right, so maybe you don't. But there was OJ Simpson's commercial when he was running through the airport in the seventies. So this is old shit. And <laughs> there was a time when I literally got to the airport and freaking plane was I ran through that airport barely made the plane and just just many times it was just by the skin of my teeth so uh but yeah it was a great experience if you have any other questions about it I'll, I'll answer but overall that was a really fun time to be a professional wrestler for me yeah time. you hit on that point you got you guys turn on raven then you and punk are teaming and then basically, like you said, he we got the, the devil, legend. right? Pretty cool. Yep. We got, yeah, I had it. He was, we were feuding with the devil. Then they kind of, we turned, he became our manager, right? I guess his yep. guys that had already run their course for them. And then they had to do something with him because he's a really good talker. So um, that was a good time too. Dutch Mantel, you know, Dutch pretty well. Oh yeah. He yeah. He was out. He was well, booking a lot of that. Him, yeah. He was still, he was booking a lot of that stuff too. So it was Jerry Jarrett, Jeff Jarrett and Dutch Mantel and, and the, and Sam, man, I remember hanging out with him and I remember hanging out with, um, Mitchell, the devil, I mean, a, a wealth of knowledge in those guys, man. You could really just listen and pick up a lot of stuff. So Raven too, Raven. Wow. Psychology, like just knows what to do and when to do it. And, 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 you know, so that was a great, great experience to, to learn. It's a really, like I said, I'm a sponge in that way. So I would go there and learn. And, uh, there's a lot of guys to learn from. It's a good time. What did you think of CM Punk at that point? I really like teaming with him. So, so where I told you earlier at ECW, I was past all that party and stuff, but I still partied. So, so he and I didn't hang out after the shows ever because he's real. He's a, when he says he's straight edge, he's, that's not a gimmick. That's for real. So, so he would go his way and I'd hang out with my group of guys. And I, you know, I was usually hanging out with like Chris Daniels and a few other guys. We'd always go out to eat, always got to drink and dance and run around. And like I said, I just make the plane by the skin of my teeth. So, so, uh, so I didn't hang out with him after the shows, but I really liked working with him during the shows and putting the matches together with him. He was easy to work with. And, uh, and I just remember him being talented and, and I remember he was much better at promos than I was. I remember there'd be times when Ray would be like, Brian, Julio, don't, don't talk to They just, we're just going to, you you're just, you don't sound like you mean it. And that's a problem with me. I don't have a personality where I can be like, you son of a mother, I'll kick this shit. I don't, I'm just not like that. So for me to, I would have to fake it. And I just, just, I liked wrestling, but sometimes playing a certain character is not what I do well. You know, everyone, wrestling is a very full faceted thing. You know, you can do one, two, three things well, but if you can't do four and five things well, you're, you're kind of limited, you know, you're almost limping around. So in certain ways I was limp. I was Raven's minion. I didn't know who I was. If I'm Raven's minion, I'm not me. I'm not Brian wall. I'm not the flu. I mean, I didn't, so I never really knew who to be. It was kind of weird. It was kind of like a spot that I, so when it came time to be me, I was like, well, you know, I just, it was, that was not easy transition for me to like get on the mic and, and, and pull that off. So he was really good at that. And obviously he made it to another place and, held world titles and main event at WrestleMania and stuff like that. But a lot of that's because he's a very good speaker and a very talented wrestler. So, but as far as a person, we got along great. I enjoyed hanging out with Mickey, Mickey and I have been friends since 1997. So I really wow. enjoyed working with her. Yeah. We go wait. She was my manager in Maryland championship wrestling. So, um, so that was a lot of fun just being with them. And I did like working with CM Punk. I really, I have Phil Brooks. I really liked working with him. Nice guy, good dude. Um, and, and enjoyed the time we spent together for sure. So as we get the wind down and head towards the finish here, any regrets in the business? I know you were kind of saying, oh, maybe you wish I would have took it seriously or wish I would have went full to the camp all the days and not took some bookings here. Any regrets in in the wrestling business? You know what? I wish I would have thought about um, where, who, who Brian Wall slash Julio De Niro, where he was supposed to be 
on a show or it's so weird when i was doing the indie wrestling in the beginning julio sanchez i was julio hot sub sanchez i had a spanish accent i'd be like my name is julio sanchez i'm here to kick your butt i would just talk like a, like a weird accent i'd say if someone had me in an arm ring i'd go i got on i had all these little things i would tell the people that i'm bringing all my family members to their country in west virginia and we're going to steal all their jobs little did i know that would really happen even they weren't my family members but like at the time 1995 so i had a shtick and uh, but as uh, as i went along um i never really honed the shtick so i wish i would have given a crap more about the personality i projected at the camera but besides that no i mean i had so much fun wrestling was so great to me and i had wonderful time and i had some of the best memories but i wish i would have taken like some of this some of the aspects of the business a little more serious i wish someone would have been like you know let's work on this let's sit you down let's figure out who you are and let's get you in front of a camera let's figure out how to do that promo better and and that would have been awesome for me i probably would have been a lot further along but at the same time, I feel like not having that much success in the business offered me the opportunity to go get a job where I'm working now since 2004. And I'm, you know, I mean, financially, I'm doing great and have a family and all that stuff. So, so it all worked out for me personally really well. But if I just gave a crap about my professional wrestling career, I regret that I didn't take the uh, promos and their personality like a little bit more serious. I was really into the wrestling, the storyline, the, or the, uh, the match move placement and you know if some guy works my knee not to use that leg to get up and i was always into the like the nuts and bolts but i wasn't into the the aura of the personality or the you know what what are you giving to the marks that are the, the fans that that they really care about like anyone can kind of get in the ring and do a bunch of mechanical moves and and, and maybe you know sell well or or uh, make it logical but you also need that personality to to come through the screen and touch people and i was not i never honestly i just didn't really think about that i wish i did so that's the answer to that question gotcha now our buddy tyler so i love tyler a, yes who put us in contact i was saying to him i was like oh man like what a career what a resume he goes he doesn't think so and i was like that's weird because wcw wwf ecw tna xpw everywhere in between mcw i was like how come he doesn't think so why why don't you you know, pat yourself on the back right. for a so great career and great resume. We'll do this. So out of everybody I've sat in a locker room with, locker room with from day one at wrestling's camp school till, till the end of my career, I'm probably in the, I'm going to call the 85th percentile. I probably did better than 84% of the other guys that I know in the industry, as far as that stuff goes, as far as getting on TV, as far as, um, but when you compare yourself to CM Punk, and you compare yourself to Matt Hardy, Jeff Hardy. I was I used to wrestle in Pennsylvania Championship Wrestling with Edge and Christian, um, Joy Mercury. We used to run her. He got a, him and Eminem tag champs, all that. So when you think about it, though, comparatively, the guys that I put myself on the level with, and I always told you, I never really, I never put anybody on a pedestal. I just always thought I was with you. I'm even Steven. So when you think about where some of your friends have gone and done and what and then really done like little wrestlemania main events and you know all that stuff so then i realized now well, you know i had all right career i had fun i wouldn't you know i wouldn't say i had this great career i mean i you know i so i compare myself to the guys that truly 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 made it people that will be remembered in 20 years for their wrestling stuff not you know so that's where i'm kind of at with that you know but i'm happy with what i did i love it i mean i, I love that i can you know sit back and you know, watch tons of televised matches. So in that sense, it's great. And, and that's, it's, I, like I said, I had a great career. Don't get me wrong. I loved it. But uh, so I'm not, I, I don't have no ego about it. You know I mean? There's guys that like blew me out of the water, like, left me in the dust. Like, you know, guys that never had to go work where I work today because they made so much money wrestling that they can literally just go to a, you know, a signing or, you know what I mean? Like they just made it. So I, in that sense, that's why I'm not like, I did so great. I did fine. You know, I loved it. But that's does that make any sense to how I'm saying? Yep, it? absolutely. All yes. right, so that's why Tyler probably thinks he doesn't think that high of himself. I mean, I did better than most, better than nine, eighty-five percent of my colleagues. But the other fifteen percent, <laughs> my colleagues, and they they know you know they're they're going to be remembered for a long time. They're on the network. They're on WrestleMania. You know, so that's where I'm. That's where the and I had chances to do that. It wasn't like I wasn't given an opportunity. I had the opportunity to do everything all those other guys did. I like I said, the personality and the promo and the, the 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 part where you connect to the audience. I didn't take it seriously enough. And and again, I needed a mentor. Probably be like, dude, let's let's 
tweak this or let's do that. Or, you know, I could have used an agent here and there. A lot of times ECW and, and TNA, I mean, kind of fend for yourself a little bit. You know what I mean? There was no, they didn't, you know, it wasn't like we're going to take this, we're going to do the six times till it's right. Or we want to make sure that you are, you know, featured in a certain way. So we need you to change that or do the. So in that sense, you kind of left your, your own defenses sometimes and, you know, but I hope I answered your question. Yes. Yes, okay. absolutely. Good. Now, as far as plugs and stuff, you probably, you don't do any social media or anything, do you? <laughs> no, I have, hey, a t- I have, I have the Julio De Niro on Twitter, but if I'm not wrestling, like I'm not a, I, when I had that show I did two years ago, I got involved and was like, but I have nothing to talk about. You know, I, I sell equipment. What am I going to talk? I, I'm not, I don't, you know, <laughs> Hey, watch me sell an excavator. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I have friends that are weird like that. They literally, they sell and rent stuff and they like take a picture of their machine at LaGuardia airport. And they're like, I just rented a, you know, a crawler boom lift at LaGuardia. And I'm like, what a loser you are. You know what I mean? That's ridiculous. But they're promoting themselves on LinkedIn or whatever. And I'm sure right. to them, Maybe someone goes, oh, I was going to order from Brian Wall. Well, I'm going to call this guy instead because he just put a picture up on LinkedIn. So, but I don't care. I'm sorry. I just don't give a damn about social media. I think it's kind of, un- if you're promoting something, if I'm in a band, if I have a match, if I have something that's kind of exciting to talk about, I will do it. So if anyone, I saw, so, you know, I have a, I have Twitter, but I don't really use it. I probably don't know my password. I probably would, <laughs> I don't even know. I know to, to hit the button and hope to write something. But, you know, if this is coming up at a certain time, I would promote that. But that's about it, you know. So gotcha. All right. Julio Adenero, thank you so much for all the time today. Really appreciate it. Awesome stuff. Gotta have you back on. That'd be great, John. Thank you very much. It was good meeting you.